Let me introduce the last speaker of the morning session, uh, Dr. Fen Tate from American Academy of Patriotics. Um, her title is Prevention, Poverty, and Patriotics. What a remarkable privilege to be here. To, I'm a pediatric neurologist. First a pediatrician, second a pediatric neurologist. So I'm in, as we say in the South, hog heaven listening to this. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Um, it's a privilege to be with scientists, with colleagues who care so much, with people who are really concerned about what happens to children and to families. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, I thought a lot about what the title should be. And, and from a pediatric perspective, what we want to do is really prevent many of the diseases that we see. You've heard about prevention. We're looking at how do, how do we not only prevent them, but how do you look at resilience, right? So all the things that we're talking about today. However, you just heard a fair amount of information about poverty, and I'm gonna give you some numbers. The numbers are staggering with respect to families and children who are living in poverty. And then what I plan on doing is to tell you some of the things that we're doing at the American Academy of Pediatrics to really try to make a difference with all of you. You'll note that I didn't say prevention, um, poverty, and pediatricians. I said prevention, poverty, and pediatrics, right? Uh, because we're not doing this alone. Uh, we, we are only going to make a difference by working together on all of this. So I have um, no financial relationships or conflicts of interest except to say I'm nuts about this. this. This is a passion of mine, and I'm sure it's a passion of all of you. It's so good to see uh, so many um, young people here, too, to, to, at the beginning of your career, at the middle of your career, and as a seasoned people here. To, to talk about this, because we, we need all, all of you to look at that. I'm going to start and end talking about families, right? Because that's, that's what we're talking about. And please indulge me for just a minute to tell you a story, as Nadine did, about two families that I took care of many, many years ago. The reason I have these two quotes is that I keep these in my office all the time and I read them a fair amount. And I read them because they were given to me by families, right? So you can, you can uh, read this quote. I love this quote. It was from uh, 1959. While you're reading the quote, let me tell you the, about the family that gave it to me. So when I was actually doing neurology, I remember, when, I remember exactly when I walked into an ICU to see a young baby with an 18-year-old unmarried mother, and the diagnosis was ultimately made of a neurodegenerative disease. And this baby um, was traked on a ventilator, and I had the remarkable privilege of working with this mother and her mother as we tried to decide what we would do and to make a very long story a little bit shorter. At 18 years of age, she took that child home with her. And back then, we were trying, I look at, at Michael here from an MCH, we were trying to get her on a waiver so we could get some help. For two years, they took care of this baby the mother and the grandmother, on a ventilator at home with no help. Essentially, no nursing that came into the home. They um, were paying a lot of their own money, and uh, they didn't have a lot of money to pay. And Tyson lived, normally children with this disease live for four years. He lived for 17 years at home and rarely came into the hospital. Now, after two years, we were able to get some, some help at home. But I tell you that to speak to what families do and how we can support them. So you could have looked at that. We could have looked at that. And I did say, I don't see how you'll be able to do this. You know, I was trying to get all the resources. And she said, I will not, I will not send my baby 
fill in the blank. And I can tell you, four years versus 17 years, and it was my privilege to be with them when Tyson passed away at 17 years of age. So think about parents and what they can do and what they have done. So that's setting it up for you. Sorry, have to go with the families on this. So um, when Jack was talking about the crossroads, I'm talking about the time is now, right? So it's not like we haven't been talking about this for a long time. So neurons to neighborhood, you know, 15 years ago. So we have the most incredible, we've heard the incredible, remarkable research, right? But we knew a lot 15 years ago. And what I think we have to think about is what's happened in those, or not happened, in, the, in those 15 years. So here's the call to action. So science is indeed the game changer. What we're hearing is the game changer. But what we're saying is how do we take that science and then make a difference in the lives of children? So how do we implement that? How do we move it forward? So how do we look at the strategies we've heard about? How do we look at communications and policies and activities? Because they have not yet reflected what we know, in my opinion, they have not yet. So here's, here's the American Academy of Pediatrics. Here's what, what we look at with our strategic priorities. And you can see right in the middle that the three priorities of the Academy are poverty and child health, early brain and child development, and epigenetics. Now, I can tell you that um, when we talked in terms of epigenetics, it took a bit of explaining why that was so important and what that means to you in practice on a daily basis. But if you look at those three things, so you look at poverty, early brain and child development, epigenetic, that's what we're talking about today, right? So, um, so we're trying. We're trying to take what you've heard today and move it into action, as you all are. So I have to talk a little bit about Bright Futures. I'm looking at uh, Dr. Liu here and others from MCHB. MCHB. Bright Futures is what we developed ac across. It's an interdisciplinary approach to care from birth to 21, right? So the one thing that I want to tell you is a new Bright Futures will be coming out uh, at, either the, at the end of this year or the first part of the next, and there are 10 different 10 different themes in Bright Futures, we've added an 11th theme. And the 11th theme has to do with uh, life course, but also with social determinants of health. So as we're looking at this, now we can have that theme just like we're talking about today. So great, we have that theme, that's part of education, that's part of what we're asking, not just pediatricians, but others to look at, but how do you implement that? So stay with me for just a little bit here. So we could spend a lot of time talking about the social determinants of health. It could be health care. It could be what you see there. Um, hold on to that piece of it. Because a big piece of that is, uh, as Nadine said, how, if, you, if you don't know their problems, if you're not screening for the problems, how can you do anything? We may not know exactly the right thing to do, but unless you know there's a problem, you will not do anything. <laughs> and so what we're looking at is that whole screening piece. So I'm going to go back and forth a little bit uh, with the call to action to say, well, here's what's happening at the federal level. Here's what we're doing. And here's what other pediatric groups are doing. Here's what you're doing, that kind of thing. So in the last year, there's been the economics of early childhood investments. Now, Dr. Heckman, we knew that too. But this was, uh, this was a White House initiative. And let me just tell you, this is not, it should never be partisan, right? So I may say what's happened in the past year, but this is not a partisan issue. And so what we're looking at, wouldn't it be wonderful if every time you turn the TV on, so here's where I get a little preachy, if every, <laughs> if every time you turn that TV on and you were looking at the candidates, the first thing that was asked is, what are you, you going to do for children? What are you going to do for children? What are you going to do for families? In, mm, instead, oh, let me go away from that. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I just can't watch it. I'm sorry, I just can't watch it. <laughs> so... 
but vote. That's all I have to say. The economics of early childhood investments, okay? So the economics that we were talking about, it was my privilege to be at these meetings. Universal preschool, wonderful. This I put in, so I just love this logo. And I, if it wasn't a little bit partisan, I'd just be using it all the time. Because what it says is invest in us. You get it? Invest in, you got it. <laughs> I'm dealing with scientists here, so. <laughs> I know you got the us on this. So I think that that's, that's great. It's, um, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be really funny. Because what we're saying is invest in the children and invest in the families. So it says build a better nation with early childhood education. And what we're saying is you can't learn if you're not healthy and well. So it's that collaboration with education and with health and wellness. It's the community piece of it. So, so I, again, I, you'll hear some of this. I'm going to just show you some of the in addition to what you're hearing today, some of the research that's just come out. So this just came out um, in January of this year from Pediatric Research. It's a whole whole journal, the, the review issue on the, on the social determinants of health, right? Great. Because what, in order to make a difference, we have to have this coming from all, all, all sectors. So we love that piece of it. State of the art review, poverty in the developing brain just came out uh, in pediatrics in April. So here's what you've heard. Um, you've heard about a lot of the stressors, and I'm going to move into poverty here. So I'll just, I'll just cue it up for just a minute on the poverty. So in the United States in 2014, if we're looking at poverty, and I, I just hold on to this piece of it, 24 million children under the age of five are living in poverty. 24 million children under the age of five. It's the poorest group in the United States of America, right? I'll show you what that means. So of those, I'm sorry, 24, sorry, 25 million children, essentially 5 million living in poverty. Of that 5 million, Head Start is funding to address, one, we love Head Start, but to, to fund one, 1 million of those. So the needs are great. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So we ask, we ask, we have the privilege of working with Head Start and child care and home visiting. And so we ask the people that are delivering the care in Head Start, what are the needs? What are the needs from a health and wellness perspective? What do you need? So hold on, here you go. I'll stop with that. We could go on and on. The, the needs are great, and what we're doing, and I, I am so in awe of the staff of Head Start and what they do and their commitment and what they're doing on a daily basis. And we are so privileged to work with them. Let me tell you these numbers, just speaking in terms of the depression. So if you look at the numbers of families, the depression of families in Head Start, it's 35 to 50% of mothers in early Head Start used to be and Head Start that identified themselves as being either moderately to severely depressed. So when I'm awake at night worrying about things and I have a real tendency to do that, maternal depression, um, what we just heard about is critical, but maternal depression for so many reasons is really critical. And we have some a little good news about that later in, in the talk, but maternal depression is a significant issue. It's also an issue for people that care for children who, who have those, um, those kind of problems. So, so I worry about homelessness. This is my worry list. I worry about homelessness. When we think of homelessness, if you're not thinking about families, we should be thinking about families. This is from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, it's one of the fa families are one of the fastest growing groups of, of homeless people in the United States. And the numbers, we don't even know the right numbers. When I talked to the National Alliance, I said, are those not, what, uh, you know, are those numbers correct? And they said, we have no idea. Because families have more of a tendency to live for a time to time in hotels and then for a time to time with other families and then for, 
you know, but it is an issue. You heard about the word gap. I'm going to go, this is, this is not new. The $30 million, this is Hart and Risley, and you've seen that. It starts early with respect to the disparities, um, and it gets worse as we go on. Now, we can talk about 30 million word disparity, but it's not just the words, as you know. It's, it's, more, it's, it's not the number of words. It's what words they're hearing, too, that's really critically important. So if we think things are really good, we haven't even really talked about food insecurity. So I'm, I know if you're not depressed, I think you probably should be. But I'm, I'm going to try to move from this depression into what, what are we going to do, where, how are we going to move forward. So in 2014, 17% of the population reported they were uh, at times in the previous 12 months when they weren't sure they would have enough food. That's up to 21%, the last one I saw from from frac. Um, that's significant. In Chicago, where I live, in certain parts of the city, it's 30 percent. Now, think about that. When we, if, if families come in to see pediatricians and we're telling them all these wonderful things to do, which we are, and are trying to help them and trying to know that if we don't know that they don't have food to feed the families at night, how can they go pick, you know, do all of the positive things that we need? So it's, it's really very linked. So you heard a little bit about this. Um, this is the one that just pushes me over the edge. It's the preschool expulsions. So you can take a look at those numbers, but the pre-K pre expulsion rate versus K to 12, and look at the disparities there. Look at the disparities. So when you're talking about mental health here, we're talking about mental health. Some people think of mental health as, as just depression or a diagnosis. We're talking about behavioral and mental. It can be anxiety. It can be, you don't have to have a diagnosis. So what we're looking at to help our members is to say, we have toolkits, we have ways to help them to look at symptoms rather than just providing you know, a drug for this or a drug for this on the diagnosis. How do you work with children and families? where the symptoms are anxiety, but the diagnosis hasn't been made. So this, this preschool expulsion, think with me through that. So if you have a child that's in preschool and you're working three jobs just to make it because of poverty, and your child gets expelled from preschool, what, what do you do? How do we look at that? But what we're saying is, how do we get to a point where children are being expelled from preschool? So what happened before that time where we might be able to intervene so that they're not getting kicked out of preschool? And let me tell you, if you look at the data, it's a downhill slope from the expulsion from preschool through school, through, and we could go even further than that. So, okay. So you heard all about this, early adversity and the health of the public. Uh, we had a resilience project. Nadine was a part of that. But the, po the point I want to show you here is this, this was funded with us from the Department of Justice. So think about it. Why is the Department of Justice worried about these adverse childhood experiences and resilience? Figure that one out. So significant adversity in childhood. I'm, I'm going to go right through these. It's associated with this. Nadine mentioned this, and I love this quote. Um, when you look at adverse childhood experience, the largest public health study you never heard of. Now, you all have heard about it. But when we go out and we're talking to pediatricians and others, it's not just pediatricians, but others. And I do the same thing. If you heard of ACEs, raise your hand. And it's usually about 10 percent of people. So. Um, I think that we need to get the word out, and we need to get it out in the right way. So the fact that you have a higher ACEs score doesn't mean you're doomed to failure. If I had looked at ACEs score on that 18-year-old, I would have said, well, you know, we're just going to take this baby out of the, you know. And, and that child had a wonderful, wonderful life on a ventilator at home, not in a room, in the middle, in the middle of the living room, always. Does that make sense? I mean, so it is different. You know I get a little passionate. Okay. 
So ACE scores, we've talked about ACE scores. The bottom line with this is that pediatricians and others are seeing kids with high ACE scores. So if you look at that on a daily basis, if you're seeing about 2,000, if you have about 2,000 patients that you're following, you're gonna see children every single day with that. So how does the ACE score fit, fit with poverty? Um, if we're looking at the poverty piece of that, I, I like this slide. Poverty is one of the most significant non-communicable diseases children are suffering from today. Whether you believe that or not, I think I could, you know, we could, we could talk about that for a while because we've heard it and we know it too. So how do we look at that? So here's just another way to look at it. We talked about food insecurity. Health insurance is better, but the housing and homeless, we haven't even talked about immigration. I haven't, I haven't even brought that one up but that is a significant issue. So here's another example of what's just come out in the literature, the Association of Child Poverty, Brain Development and Academic Achievement. You've already heard, you've, you've heard a lot of that. And, and at least uh, from the commentary talking about poor cognitive and academic performance, you just heard that already. So here are the consequences of child health, uh, of poverty on child health. Infant mortality, low birth weight, chronic diseases, food insecurity, poor nutrition. I, you can not have enough food, you can have the wrong food. You wanna talk about obesity for a while because that's another whole issue here. Poor access, even if you have, have CHIP, even if you have ACA, even if you have that access to healthcare, that getting to the right healthcare, that's another one. Um, accidental injury and mortality, obesity we talked about. So let's talk a little bit about the federal poverty level and, uh, and then we'll move on to what we think should be done. So it was actually, um, I, I didn't realize this till I started looking, I thought, well, how did they come up with the federal poverty level of 100% federal, 200? Then We started what, a little ways back, 63 and 64. Some of you weren't born then. And um, if you're looking at 100% of the federal poverty level for a family of two, it's $23,000, two adults, two children. Think about how you're gonna live on that. A, you know, some people hear that and think, well, that's a, you know, no, think about it. So here are the poverty trends by age group where we're talking in terms of what happens with the children. So um, when I'm saying that they're the highest group living in poverty, you can look and see that adults over 65 are actually we kind of fixed that a while back with Social Security and other things, adults, and then they are the children, right? 25% of children, zero to five, live below the federal poverty level. Okay, let's talk about um, race and ethnicity. Take a look at that one. Uh, if you look at uh, Hispanic, uh, black, and white, um, really unacceptable. So the other thing that we forget about with children, right, you don't forget about if you have young children, is the whole issue of child care. So think how much that costs you in here with children that, are, that need child care. And think how people in poverty can obtain that care. Look at the numbers right here. So what we said is if you really look at childcare and how much that costs, and we, you, know, you can argue back and forth, are those the right numbers or the wrong numbers? And I am telling you, it's a significant part of what you earn. So if you're saying that, and you look at those numbers, then 43% of children are living below the 200% of the federal poverty level. So we have, th so if you say, but we have ways to fix that, right? We have SNAP, so we have supplemental nutrition, those kind of things, and it does help. So you could look at this and say, SNAP helps keep some families out of poverty um, and helps keep some families out of deep poverty. So what do you think deep poverty? People talk about that a bit. So deep poverty is this, extreme poverty, living on less than $2 per day per family member. There's a new book out called Two, $2 a Day. There's also a new book out called Eviction. 
take a look at the eviction one. If you can't read that whole eight, what, 700 pages, look at the epilogue on eviction and see what's happening with people in poverty. Okay, so all of that's happening. It's horrible, but what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So as was mentioned earlier, we, first of all, when we look from an academy perspective, we're looking at education of our members, we're looking at support for our members, and this is not just our members, but thankfully it goes across the United States and international, and people other than pediatricians look at those, for which we're grateful. So we are looking at, we put out a new AAP report and policy statement on child poverty. Uh, we're looking, in that includes the screening and referral resources and advocacy resources. Here's the statement, recommendations for pediatricians to screen for basic needs. I'm going to talk more about screening in just a little bit. Adopt integrated programs within the medical home and look at advocacy. And the technical report, which is longer, tells you in more detail, describes the demographics, looks at it as a source of stress. So if, if the time is now and we've heard all of this, what else can we do right now? We continue to learn from the science. Uh, as Jack was saying, we need to learn, and I so agree with that, what, what makes it work here and what makes it not work here and, and looking at those pieces. But what we're looking at is uh, looking at, from our perspective, a Center on Healthy, Resilient Children, which we're beginning to establish, that speaks to building stronger families and ending toxic stress. And for our members and others, we're looking at both the policies, the community-based participatory research, the partnerships with you all, and the major society stakeholders to look at these things. So one thing that I haven't heard a lot about thus far is community. And I think whenever we're looking at, this is, uh, I'm sure, a duh to all of you, but when we're looking at where we need to be and what we need, it, certain things work. We haven't heard community, and I haven't heard culture yet. And so I think that as we're looking, and I know that, that as researchers, we're looking at all of those things, but one size will not fit all, right? And what we're looking at in the United States really is just changing demographics. Look at the changing demographic, which is, I think that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, but how do we help adjust to those changing demographics in the right way? I don't like cultural competence. It's, we can't, we're not competent in other people's culture. I'm Southern, you're not competent unless you grew up there, and you may not be there. But, but, <laughs> but if we're looking at, if we're looking at um, the community and the culture, we just have to be humble. So what I like is cultural humility, and, um, and we have to have cultural effectiveness, however we define that. So as we're looking at all of these programs, we're saying to our members and to others, think about this. No matter what you're doing, think about, think about this. So you've heard the scientific expertise, and we're saying as we move forward, we really need to catalyze a fundamental change. And that fundamental change really is in early childhood policy and services. So help us uh, make those changes and what we're looking at. So let's talk for a little bit about screening. So if we look at, from our perspective, from Bright Futures and otherwise, we are asking our members and nurse practitioners and family docs and everyone to screen for about 15 different things. I started just listing them as we were going through that. So from birth to 21, you're screening for 15 to 20, depending on how you break it down. So how in the world can that be done in the context of, say, primary care? Let's just say primary care. It, it can't be done unless it's done with a team, right? So what we're doing, both from educating and in medical school and in, in uh, residency and afterwards, we're saying, look at the team. Look at the community. We are not asking you to do everything on your own, because let me tell you, I hear about that all the time, that you're asking too much. We can't do it. So what we're saying is we, can we will help. 
we will figure a way. And they're not funded to do it. I mean, those are the th kind of things that we're having. So numerous screens. If you look back, so this is good news that we just found out on, on two things, and I, I put it in here because I'm so excited about it. But one of the things that we just looked at was developmental screening. So uh, developmental screening in pediatrics. So we know that Head Start screens, that we know that others are screening. What we're saying is the most important thing are the families and that families don't get mixed messages with nine, you know, either they don't get screened or five people screen them and someone tells them those things. So we're saying let's, let's make sure that we link back together in the medical home and I could spend a lot of time talking about what that means. But, but what a true medical home is is that collaborative piece. So we just looked again. You, you've heard horrible things. I always thought they were horrible. That screening occurred in 2002 in, in pediatrics at the rate of, oh, about 20% with, with a validated screener. So we just received the, the latest uh, survey that we have, and it's now up to 62%. So we went from 20 to 40 to 62%. That's great, and then there's that 40% that we're still looking at. And that's over 14 years, so it's slow. Slow process and slow movement, but we're moving in the right direction and we'll, we'll have to do that. So um, I, I'm really pleased and grateful to announce that from an academy perspective, and thanks, thank you um, to the JPB Foundation, we have a grant that we're gonna be looking at developmental social determinants of health and maternal depression in primary care. And what we're looking at, think about there's a changing, um, health care is transforming around us, with us, in many ways. It's not like it used to be, right? So it used to be that there were one, two, and three people practices, and you get to them and you teach them that, and now it's only 8% of our members who are in one, two, or three uh, person practices, right? 8%. So the rest are in. FQHCs are bigger practices, are ACO-like uh, groups, you know, those kind of things. So what we're looking at is how do you help screen in, in all the different situations. So we'll have actually a national advisory board. We'll look at a national collaborative to say what does it take to screen. We're particularly looking at, at developmental writ large. I'm looking at Ellen back there. Developmental is developmental, behavioral, the bigger issue, but you could break it down into neuromotor to behavior. We're trying to say, look at the whole thing, and you'll hear about the Zwick uh, l later today, maternal depression. And what we are saying is we have to provide the resources to, to pediatricians to do that. We hear time and time again, I don't want to screen because I don't know what to do. Well, unless we screen, we don't know even what the needs are. So it's, it's kind of an interesting piece there. So what we're doing is trying to say, screen, and here are the resources, and here's what you need to do with respect to follow-up, and here's what's in your community, your community, because they're different. They're, now, there are national resources that are really quite important. So... Um, Stay tuned on that. So we have practice resources. This just came from academic uh, pediatrics that looked at child poverty. They called it an attack on our nation's human capital. An attack on our nation's hu human capital. So um, some of you may have heard just last week, I think it was uh, NICHQ and the Einhorn Family Trust put out, had a webinar that looked at promoting young children's socioeconomic uh, development, socio-emotional and economic development in primary care and listed five different ways that we could do that. So we'll be working with them and otherwise. Here's the screening update. So I mentioned the periodic survey uh, results, but this is what I'm really excited about. Um, just yesterday, just yesterday, so I put this in late last night, we uh, received the information from CMS that from an informational bullet, bulletin. Now, those of you who have worked at the state level know what an informational bulletin means to Medicaid. It, uh, it doesn't say you have to do it, but it gives you permission to do it. And so, so many of us have been working on this, and I'm sure at the federal level, you all have been working on it, but we've really been looking at advocacy. So here's what it said. State Medicaid agencies may cover maternal depression as a part of well-child visits. 
under EPSDT, which are the basic things. So now some states, you know, Massachusetts and others, have moved forward with their own maternal depression and are doing great things. But not most states looking at this. And our members have never had this opportunity. So this is a significant move so that we can look at exactly how we screen for maternal depression, how we work with, particularly with ACOG, with, with OBGYNs, and what, what happens there. Now, what we also have to look at, and you all know this, I'm sure, is just the, the workforce. So how do, we, how do we have the workforce that we can refer both, both mothers and children to? So advocacy, education, other partnerships, foundations, community-based organizations. I think we have to really look at faith-based groups. And I know I'm keeping you from your lunch, so I'm almost done. I only have 100 more slides. <laughs> um, if, we're, if we are really looking at this, I wanted to give you one example that I thought was great. So we were talking, I think you have to look at different ways to get to families, different pieces of information in different settings. And this is not about bad families. What families want to know is, how is my child, and am I doing okay? And how can I do better? In the worst circumstances, that's what I think overwhelmingly they want to know. So that's why we have to be ready for that. So this was um, too small to fail. Uh, worked with the, I don't know, I can't tell you the exact title, but there is a national organization of laundromat owners, of laundromat owners, and they give once a year a free day across the United States to let anyone come and wash clothes free. There are lines that go around blocks waiting to get in to do that. And so they worked with the laundromat leaders to give out information, fun things for the kids, information on reading, reach out and read, those kind of things as they were standing in line, and then they followed up with them. Now, does that mean all is well because you gave that out? No, but it's a different way to get information out to families. If you're standing in line and kids need to know something, then give them the information. What I look at on that, I never thought about the laundromat, right? So we, I think we have to look at those kind of things, too. So advocacy, we're saying invest in young children, support, expand essential benefits program, particularly from a poverty perspective. Uh, the housing piece is a huge issue, and the models that we use. So one of the things that we're really looking at is positive parenting, right? So strength-based parenting and positive parenting, and does it make a difference? if that's provided through someone that you trust and love, rather than someone telling you, you know, you're, you're, you know, you need this positive parenting. So what person in here wouldn't need a little parenting advice? So I think that's what we have to be really cautious about, is not to say those people. So we can't say those people, those people who live in poverty, those people who are bad parents, those people. They're, this is all of us and what we all need. So we'll hang on to that. We, we really love the home visiting, Michael, and, and what it can do and is doing. There are many others. So we have resources. There are state-based programs that we're looking at. For example, in Nebraska, there's a whole pro-kid policy plan for Nebraska. So when we're thinking about this, we're looking at practice, we're looking at community, we're looking at state, and we're looking at federal. So how do you make a difference with that? So I find this just so fascinating. So, um, so the National Academy of Sciences, the old IOM, was, was funded recently at $750,000, million, $750, and they're trying to get a million dollars to look at poverty, which is great because what they're saying is to, to look at measures, and um, they're looking at cutting poverty in half, uh, in 10 years. That's what their goal is supposed to be. Stay tuned on that one. So our impact on kids with or without toxic stress must be meaningful, tangible, and it will be forever if we're looking at that. And then I will end with this one on time. So this came from a father who came to the Academy, the American Academy of Pediatrics, to talk to us um, about how to get families even more involved in what we're doing. Now, we've worked with him for years. And he has a young adult that has, 
girl who has Haley, who has very special needs, and uh, he and his wife have taken that piece of it to make a real difference in Texas, the state of Texas, looking at everything from family voices to family to family health systems. This is what he put up when uh, he was talking to the staff at the academy. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. But here's what he meant, and here's what he said. You are not here to merely make a living. You are here to enable the world to live more amply with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are, now, where he put world, he put in family, right? You're here to make a difference. You're here to enable families to live more amply with greater vision, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich families, and you impoverish yourself and families if you forget that. So we're all here to do that, and thank you for your patience and the opportunity to be here.